Kings chapter 7, going to begin reading in verse 1. Thank you, worship team. While you're finding your way there, uh, thank you for your prayers for phase 2. This last week, uh, we put insulation and plywood up on the roof. We put a uh, moisture barrier. Uh, we're getting ready for the delivery of the skylight, and so we had to put all that material on the roof because the skylight is sitting on top of that, and then the finished roof goes on top of that. Uh, at the end, the finished roof will match this roof on this building, and so uh, that's all coming very quickly. The bricks are about to be delivered to us. September 12th is the, uh, the scheduled date, and they want to start right away on the brick exterior. And so in the next couple of weeks, you're going to see the whole outside of the building starting to come together. Uh, we want to get it uh, all dried in in time for uh, winter so we can keep working inside. So thanks for your prayers. Thank you for your giving. We still have a ways to go on giving, and, and we just thank you so much for all your sacrifices. And thank you especially for your prayers. So the Bible says it's not by might and not by power but it's by the Spirit of God that uh, we're doing this. Look with me in Romans chapter 7, and we're going to begin reading in verse 1. Let's talk about a marriage I'm dying to get out of. Romans 7, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to men who know the law, that the law has authority over a man only as long as he lives? For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. So then if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress, even though she marries another man. So, my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. For when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies so that we bore fruit for death. But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the letter. I'm not going to read the next couple of verses, uh, although you should read them. But uh, Paul has said some very negative things about the law, and so he balances that with some more positive statements uh, showing that the law is good and that the law actually had a, a good outcome, a good role to play. But let's jump down to verse 21 and let's finish out the end of this chapter. Paul says in Romans seven twenty-one. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. Oh, what a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for the people you love so much and for your powerful word. Father, I pray that we would encounter you today through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen. I want everybody to catch this statement. The way that we escape the frustration of Christian religion is to pursue an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the message that I want everyone to take away today from Romans 7. As your pastor, I am recommending a divorce for every person here today. I'm recommending a divorce to people who have been married for decades. I'm recommending a divorce to single people. I'm recommending a divorce to the kids in elementary school that we just prayed for. I'm recommending a divorce to people who have been out of school for years, a divorce for everybody today. I have some bad news and I have some good news. The bad news is that for far too long, you have languished under a husband who is domineering, even abusive. You have languished under a husband who has left you bored and unfulfilled. You've languished under a husband who has brought out the worst in you and has held you back from becoming all that God has for you. You've languished under a husband who has fathered children 
that are bad seed. But the good news is there's already another man waiting in the wings for you. There's a man waiting who loves you unconditionally in spite of all your shortcomings and hang-ups and all your peculiar ways. There's a man waiting whose name is faithful and true. Those are just two of his many good nicknames. There's a man waiting who will bring out the best in you and empower you to become all that God has destined you to be. There's a man waiting to father beautiful children with you. There's a man waiting for you who will never leave you and never forsake you. Even death cannot separate you from him. But the bad news is your old husband won't give you a divorce. The only way out of your old marriage is to die. But the good news is you can die and still stay alive. Obviously, I'm not talking about earthly marriage today, and neither is Paul in Romans 7. When we look to the Bible for counsel about divorce and remarriage, Romans 7 is not one of the passages that we look to. Romans 7 is a metaphor. It teaches spiritual truths about our salvation and about our Christian life. It's not a teaching on divorce and remarriage. I don't want anyone to leave here today and say, the Lord spoke to me and it's okay to divorce my spouse. That was not the Lord speaking. That's not what he's speaking about. The husband that I want you to divorce is Christian religion. And you already know the husband who's waiting in the wings. It's Jesus. Romans 7 is the most confusing and the most controversial chapter in this letter. It's confusing because at first glance, Paul seems to contradict himself. In Romans 6, Paul boldly declares that we have died to sin. We are no longer prisoners to sin. We talked about that. But then in Romans 7, Paul says that he is a prisoner of sin. So what is up with that? If the great apostle Paul really didn't have victory over sin, where does that leave the rest of us who are certainly not in the same league as Paul? Are we really free or are we still slaves? Are we free theoretically only or are we free actually? Well, we are free in Christ, but we can slip back under bondage and so Romans 6 and 7 are written as encouragements to us to stay free. What Paul calls the law in Romans 7, I am calling Christian religion. How did I get there? Well, Romans 7 is written by a Christian to Christians addressing a Christian problem. In the Roman church and in all of the first century churches, the majority of believers were Jews and God-fearing Gentiles, Gentiles who were avid students of the Jewish faith. When the good news of Jesus came along, the new Jewish and God-fearing believers had to figure out what to do with the Jewish law. Were they still required to keep the law? Were new Gentile believers who came to Christ required to come under the Jewish law? You see, the law was so ingrained in them that they were uncomfortable with the notion of abandoning it. And then there were teachers from Jerusalem insisting that all Christians must keep the law. For Paul, the problem is not the contents of the law. The problem is religion. The problem is self-righteousness. Trying to please God through my own efforts to keep his commandments. The problem is self-reliance, thinking that we have enough strength, enough willpower to resist temptation and avoid sin. The problem is self-confidence, feeling smug about how hard we try and about how much better we are than others. The problem is self-vindication, the belief that we can cancel out our own wrongs by accumulating enough good deeds or enough religious Acts. A handful of us here at Harvest Time were born Jewish, but all of us were born under religion. In Romans 5, we learned the bad news that we are all born sinners. In Romans 6, we learned the bad news that we are all born slaves. In Romans 7, we learned the bad news that we're all born married to a loser. His name is religion. 
Most of us here were born into a Christian religion of one kind or another. Some of us were born into one of the other major world religions. We have people who were born Muslim who are followers of Jesus at harvest time now. People who were born Hindu and Buddhist who are now followers of Jesus. People who were born spiritists, occultists, now they're followers of Jesus. But you know, even those of us who were born into irreligious families are still born under religion. Philosophers are under religion. Secular humanists are under religion. Even atheists are under religion. All of us are born under the dominion of self-righteousness, of self-reliance, whether we're trying to please a deity or whether we're trying to be good for goodness sake, we're all born believing we can do it ourselves. It goes right back to the deception in the garden. And when we come to Christ, we have to figure out what to do with that religion, just like the first believers did. Some of the first believers turned their faith into what could be called Old Testament Christianity. They believed in Christ, but they fell back into an Old Testament experience of sin and frustration and spiritual deadness. And so it is today that many Christians are trapped in the frustration of lifeless Christian religion. Instead of experiencing the beautiful, dynamic freedom of a relationship with Jesus Christ, religion is just dead and dry. So how do we divorce Christian religion and stay divorced from it? Looking at Paul's words in Romans 7, I see three steps. And I want to share them with you quickly this morning. How do we divorce Christian religion and stay divorced from it? Three steps from Romans 7. The first step is this. Admit that religion is a frustrating spouse. Admit that religion is a frustrating spouse. To many Bible scholars, Romans 7 is an embarrassment. Paul's emotions are so raw. His confessions are so candid that they can't believe that Paul can be speaking as a Christian. They think that Paul must be recounting his past experience as a Jewish Pharisee before he met Christ. And indeed, Paul does recall his religious past, but he also describes the frustration that we might experience as Christians if we fall back under religion. In Romans 6, we saw that freedom from sin begins with knowing something. And so it is in Romans 7. Freedom from religion begins with knowing something, with knowing the shortcomings of our old spouse, religion. Looking at Paul's words in Romans 7, I see a few ways that religion is a frustrating spouse. Religion is a frustrating spouse because it teaches morality, but it can't transform our conduct. You know, among the world's moral philosophies and religions, the Jewish law is the gold standard of morality. But Paul says that even the Jewish law failed to produce goodness inside of him. In chapter 8, verse 3, Paul says that the law was powerless because of our human sinfulness. There's nothing wrong with the law. The law is flawless. The law comes from God. The law is holy and righteous and good. But the law was given to people who are already sinners, and the law can't change that. The law tells us what God is like. It tells us what God expects us to be like. But the law lacks the power to deal with the problem of our sin. Only the cross can do that. And it's the same with every other religion and moral philosophy. They are all an exercise in futility because they promote lofty ideals, but they lack the power to deal with the problem of sin. You've got to admit, Religion is a frustrating spouse. Religion is frustrating because it dominates us in an unhealthy way and it's reluctant to let us go. Two times in Romans 7, Paul says that the law lords it over people. Jesus used this very same expression when he talked about abusive government officials. He said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials abuse their authority. But I am not like that, and don't you be like that either. 
Just like a bad government, religion controls people through fear and intimidation. Religion places heavy burdens on people. Religion taxes people. Religion suppresses joy. It requires conformity and squashes God-given individuality and creativity. Religion engenders resentment. Just like an evil dictatorship, religion doesn't want to let people out of its clutches. When you try to leave religion, it holds you in the grip of guilt and fear and intimidation. Religion is a frustrating spouse. Religion is frustrating because it's boring. <laughs> Paul says that under the law we served in the oldness of the letter, but now in Christ we serve in the newness of the spirit. Religion is stale and repetitive. It's not fresh. It's just the same old thing over and over again. It's not inspiring. It's not relevant. It doesn't speak to you. It doesn't offer help or hope. Religion is not revelatory. There is no fresh prophetic word from heaven. Last week made 20 years that we're here at harvest time. Then on Tuesday morning, I woke up out of an awesome dream about phase two. It's the first dream that I've had about the new building in a little while. And I emailed our friend Candace Simmons with some of the details of the dream. And when she emailed back her impressions from the Lord, the Holy Spirit spoke an awesome word to me. Don't have time to share the details now, but I want to tell you it filled me with hope and filled me with faith and with anticipation. You see, religion doesn't do that. It can't do that. Religion is duty and discipline and drudgery. It leaves you cold and cranky. Newness of life in Christ is propelled by intimacy and love for him. Religion is a frustrating spouse. Religion is frustrating because it turns plain old wrongdoers into first-class hypocrites. We'll explore this a little bit more in a minute. But Paul says that before he understood the law, he didn't know that he was sinning. But the law came along and it ruined his party. The law came along and let him know that what he was doing was wrong and, and he kept doing it anyway. And religion does that. It turns mistakes into transgressions. It turns wrong actions into violations of the law, which are far more egregious. Blissful ignorance of sin is better than willful disobedience. Under the one, you're just ignorant, but under the other, you're a hypocrite. Religion is frustrating. It's frustrating because it creates inner conflict. Paul says it's not that he wanted to be a hypocrite. He really wanted to do what was right. He just couldn't. And so began the punishing cycle of sin, followed by guilt, followed by penance, followed by more sin, followed by more guilt. Religion causes confusion. It doesn't lead to peace. It leads to self-loathing. Religion is frustrating because it prevents us from experiencing true intimacy with Christ. Paul says that while we are under religion, we can't truly belong to Christ. Religion prevents us from truly trusting Christ because we're still trusting in ourself. It prevents us from fully surrendering to Christ. It prevents us from fully experiencing Christ. Religion is a frustrating spouse. Religion is frustrating because not only it cannot save us, but it exposes us to greater judgment. Paul says that the law deceived him. It held out to him the promise of life, but instead it made him more culpable for his sin than ever before. Any way you look at it, you have to admit that religion is a frustrating spouse. How do we divorce Christian religion and stay divorced from it? Three steps in Romans 7. Admit the frustration of religion. Second, thank religion for doing you a favor. After saying so many negative things about the law, Paul has to bring some balance in the middle of Romans 7. He says that all of these negative consequences of the Jewish law ultimately served a positive purpose in his life. The Jewish law is not bad. It was given by God. It's holy and good. But what the law showed Paul is Paul is bad and needed a savior. There's a parallel in the book of Galatians chapter 2, Paul writes, 
through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. And religion can serve the same purpose in our lives. Religion can never save us, but it can frustrate us to the point that we realize that we need a savior. Religion is a frustrating spouse, but you can thank religion. You can thank religion for highlighting your sinfulness. Paul recalls his childhood here as a nice Jewish boy. He says that he was alive apart from the law, but when it came time for his bar mitzvah, he studied the law. He became what the rabbis called a son of the law. And studying the law, he realized that he was a sinner. Paul says it was the 10th commandment that got him, the same one that nailed the rich young ruler. You see, the first nine commandments are all things to do, and Paul had kept the first nine commandments perfectly, just like the rich young ruler, but the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet, has to do with an attitude of the heart. And Paul realized when he read it that that one he faltered on. And he said something strange happened. He said when he understood the prohibition, suddenly he coveted more than ever. He said the commandment aroused sin inside of him. You see, that's the way it works. Law and sin are partners. Religion and sin are partners together. They tag team us and provoke us to sin. They turn us from ignorant wrongdoers into hardcore sinners. Well, school has started again, and for the first time in nine years, I am making my kids ride the bus this year because my grace for the parent drop-off and pickup line is completely gone. <laughs> I, I simply cannot do it anymore. I said, Lord, if I drive my kids one more year, I'm going to lose my sanctification altogether. <laughs> Two years ago, I was in the middle school parking lot waiting to pick up my kids, and our friend Vinny O'Neill texted me. He was across a lot waiting for his girls, and he said hi, and I texted back. And then he texted, and he said, why do you always turn left out of the parking lot? And I said, well, that's my way home. His house was to the right. And he said, but what about the no left turn sign? <laughs> and I said, what sign? Sure enough, I looked, and there was a no left turn sign at the end of the driveway where I had turned every day for the entire school year. I was absolutely stunned. I was seriously so busy talking to my kids when they get in the car, dodging school buses and middle schoolers and, and cars, that I, I seriously never saw the sign. I didn't know all that time that I was breaking the law. Now, you have to know a couple of things. First of all, everybody was turning left out of the parking lot. <laughs> Secondly, you have to understand what turning right meant for me. Rather than turning left in just a very short stretch of road out to the post road, turning right meant that I have to sit in a very long line of cars all making lefts onto Byram Road when I had to make a right. And then after I make a right on Byram Road, I have to sit not through one, but two four-way stops before sitting in another long line of cars trying to get across the post road. And I had to turn right there and then come up to the traffic light where I would have reached minutes before if I had only turned left. <laughs> so now I had a dilemma. I knew the right thing to do, but I didn't want to do it. <laughs> so what did I do as a good pastor? Well, I waited until Vinny turned right out of the parking lot, and then I turned left. <laughs> and I turned left every day for the rest of the school year under the shadow of the no left turn sign. And I felt guilty every time. You see, that's what religion does to us. Religion highlights our sinfulness. Let's us know we're bad. Now we're not just innocently mistaken. Now we are willfully rebellious. And the more we're told not to do something, the more determined we are to do it. I turned into a hardcore left-hand turner against the no left-hand turn sign. Religion is a frustrating spouse, but we can thank religion. 
We can thank religion for bringing us to a place of spiritual desperation. I think every one of us can relate to the gut-wrenching emotion that Paul pours out at the end of Romans 7. He said, I don't understand what is wrong with me. I want to do what's right, but I can't do it. I hate doing wrong, but I can't stop doing it. When I want to do good, Ben and Jerry's is right there in the freezer. <laughs> There's a war going on inside of me. I'm a prisoner to sin. Oh, wretched man that I am. There is no good thing dwelling inside of me. You see, it's only in that place of spiritual desperation that escape from religion is finally found. Jesus talked about this spiritual desperation. He called it in the Sermon on the Mount, poverty of spirit. It's the moment that I finally recognize that I am utterly unable to help myself. I am utterly unable to transform myself or vindicate myself. Jesus said when we reach that moment, we have reached the entryway to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said it. This kind of mourning that Paul expresses in Romans 7, it's necessary for us. This kind of hungering and thirsting after righteousness, it's necessary for us to experience the blessings of salvation and the kingdom of God. Is religion frustrating? You betcha. But it can also do us the favor of bringing us to our knees in front of the cross of Christ. How do we divorce Christian religion and stay divorced from it? Three truths from Romans 7. Admit to the frustration of religion. Thank religion for doing you a favor. And finally, pursue freedom through intimacy with Jesus Christ. I want you to notice, worship team, you can help me. I want you to notice how the frustration of Romans 7 ends. It doesn't end with a what, it ends with a who. In my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in my members, waging a war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of a law of sin. What a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me? Thanks be to God. Jesus Christ will. You see, religion asks what? Whether it's Jewish religion or another world religion or even Christian religion, religion asks what must I do? What prayers must I recite? What penance must I make? What saints must I venerate? What men must I obey? What rules must I keep? What sacrifice must I offer? What rituals must I perform? What good deeds must I do? What must I do? There was a group of sincere religious people. They approached Jesus one day and they said, Master, what works must we do to satisfy God? Religion always asks what? But Jesus answered them with a who. He said the work of God is only this. To believe in the one that he sent. You see there's a moment of believing on Jesus. There's a moment of saving faith. When we are united with him in a new relationship. It's so intimate that Paul says that we become one with him. And in a way that I can't even fully explain to you, Paul says that his experiences, his experiences on the cross, in the grave, his experience of resurrection, it becomes our experience. We are co-crucified with him and co-resurrected with him. We die to sin and we die to the dominion of the law. The way that we escape the religious frustration of Romans 7 is to pursue a relationship with the who of Romans 7. The way we divorce religion and stay divorced from it is to fall in love with Jesus. The way we divorce religion and stay divorced is to trust in Him for salvation alone. It's to surrender to Him, to commit to Him, to pursue intimacy with Him. 
You know, a new school year is starting now. What might happen if we did that? What might happen if we decided to trade in the stale, old, frustrating, repetitive Christian religion going through the motions and doing our duty? What if we decided to trade that in instead for the beauty of an intimate relationship with Jesus? What if we pursued him through worship and prayer, through his word, through fellowship and service with the body of Christ? Then we might experience the beautiful newness of life that comes from belonging to Jesus.